that Western liberalism finally had prevailed, and that was really the end. It wasn't going to be a convergence between capitalism and socialism. Uh, it was an unabashed victory. History has ended. And the question really is whether or not you could say the same thing as a result of convergence. Does this mean that the regulations that had previously created different First Amendment standards for different media are going to become a thing of the past? What we have going for us in this regard, at least one argument in favor of that, is another tradition in First Amendment law that basically says not that each medium is a law unto itself, but that the basic commands of the First Amendment, regardless of the medium, do not vary. They are the rule. And this was articulated in Joseph Burns, uh, Burston and Company, uh, which was a 1952 decision in which the Supreme Court said after 37 years, yes, cinema is protected after all, and it receives full First Amendment protection. And so the lesson to take away from that is that at least in some cases, uh, you have, even for media that previously were considered unprotected, once they receive cultural penetration, once they're accepted in society, you have an embrace by the courts and the grant of full First Amendment protection. Right, uh, for full First Amendment protection. Uh, and, and the question is whether or not that's going to become the norm as opposed to the uh, rule from sound trucks that each medium is a law unto itself. The decisions that have been issued by the Supreme Court in the wake of Pacifica suggest that there may be something to this. Uh, each of them struck down regulations that were similar to the broadcast and decency regulations uh, or that had some other extension of, uh, of regulatory authority uh, that ultimately was struck down because the court recognized that that medium, that technology, was to be protected. Sable Communications struck down dial a porn regulations. Denver area. Uh, struck down regulations involving indecency on public least um, and, um, and public and, and least access channels on cable. Reno versus ACLU, as I mentioned, indecency regulation of the internet. Playboy was the uh, signal bleed regulations. Ashcroft versus Free Speech Coalition involved fictional depictions of child porn, not involving actual children, but just imaginary child porn. Uh, and then Ashcroft versus ACLU was a successor regulation to the Communications Decency Act, the Child Online Protection Act, and the question was, there, whether or not Congress could do, essentially have a do-over and try and adopt regulations uh, like the indecency rules, and the court said in this case, or at least sent it back to the lower courts, saying that you haven't justified it under the First Amendment. Now, here's the exception from last term, and some will say it's the exception that proves the rule, although I think it's important to note, exceptions never prove the rule. Exceptions always test the rule. So the Fox case was the one that came up from the Second Circuit involving the FCC's indecency rules. Uh, it um, is where the uh, Second Circuit had said that the FCC's fleeting expert policy, where you have unscripted language on broadcasts, whether or not that uh, can be enforced against under the FCC's indecency rules. Uh, the Second Circuit had said no, the FCC had failed to fully explain its change in policy, and under the Administrative Procedure Act it held that the FCC's change in policy was invalid. Uh, it also discussed the First Amendment aspects, but didn't decide them. Went to the Supreme Court, and this decision came down purely as an administrative law decision, saying that the FCC's explanation was close enough for government work. And so as a result, sent it back to the Second Circuit to see if, you know, uh, looking at the constitutional aspects, you would reach a different result. But here, the second bullet point is the one that I think is uh, important for purposes of looking at technology in the First Amendment in that it suggests a new rationale for regulating broadcast indecency separate from, somewhat separate from the ones that had been um, uh, accepted before. And that is suggesting that the Commission might conclude that the pervasiveness of foul language and coarsening of pub public entertainment on other media, like cable, justifies more stringent regulation of broadcasting so as to give conscientious parents a relatively safe haven for their children. It does not seem that current members of the Supreme Court have children or much familiarity with technology uh, if they think that this is going to create a safe haven simply to move bad words on broadcasting until after 10 p.m. Because after all, that has been tried in another guise. <laughs> Some people at least recognize the, uh, the reference. Uh, Andre Maginot was the um, uh, Minister of Defense for France after World War I. He proposed and successfully persuaded his country to build 
the Maginot Line, which was a fixed line about 150 miles long of tank, um, uh, tank barriers and gun emplacements all facing toward Germany. So as if there were hostilities again between Germany and France, that France would be impregnable, that it would be impossible for the German invaders to make it into France because after all, they had sealed off the borders with the Maginot Line. But of course, <laughs> best laid plans, uh, World War II came along and the German tanks simply went around the line. And so the term Maginot Line has become synonymous with the notion of a comically ineffective solution to a given problem. Which brings me back to the Supreme Court and the safe haven for broadcasting. Uh, here we see a nuclear family, of, well, actually they're glowing green, so they must be a nuclear family, uh, watching television. And of course they're being protected uh, by the FCC's indecency rules saying they cannot see that broadcast until after 10 p.m. The problem, of course, is that that isn't the only way people get information anymore. It's not even close. And even if broadcasting were the way that most people got all of their information, uh, in a world in which people can watch a broadcast anytime they want to, maybe they've downloaded the podcast, maybe they have a DVR, maybe they have any one of a number of, you know, a, half a dozen other technologies, then having a rule that says that the broadcast has to be after a given time really doesn't do anything about uh, securing the government's objective of sealing off that family or those children from the offending content. Now, that sort of brings us up to today, and the question is whether or not convergence is going to continue to um, essentially result in First Amendment victories, whether or not it's going to continue to unravel the regulations that still exist. And this, I suggest, is really an open question, and one that is currently teed up at the FCC, and to a certain extent the Federal Trade Commission, and one that we're going to be exploring quite a bit, I think, over the next few years. It isn't a new phenomenon. The convergence of media has not always been latched onto as a justification for peeling back of regulations. Some have embraced it as an argument for increasing regulations. Even as far back as 1987 in Senate hearings on the Fairness Doctrine, Professor uh, Robert Louis Sheehan of the Annenberg School of Communication suggested that the fact that newspapers are delivered to printing presses by means of satellite delivery that that would be a regulatory justification for imposing the fairness doctrine on traditional media, because after all, they're using new media tools. And there are certain regulations that exist at the FCC, or at least haven't yet been challenged, uh, that essentially rely on, I guess, regulatory inertia, uh, that do apply certain regulations, even though, I think, if put to the test under the prevailing constitutional standard, it would, be a difficult, it would be difficult to justify those regulations. So for example, children's advertising regulations, political broadcasting, closed captioning rules have been applied to cable operators and then by proxy to cable networks. Uh, the FCC has issued enforcement decisions involving uh, video news releases uh, to uh, cable, uh, cable operators. And so I think there's a real question of whether or not constitutionally uh, the FCC would be able to do that. There are also proposals currently pending at the FCC to regulate cable networks directly, something that the FCC does not do, or at least hasn't done so far, <coughs> as opposed to regulating cable operators where it does have more of a jurisdictional hook. And so those things are all just sort of floating out there. Now, uh, there also have been some rather direct um, examples of people advocating the expansion of public interest regulation um, and most actively in the 90s when Reed Hunt was chairman of the FCC. Within a, just really a couple of months of coming to that position, he expressly advocated renewing what he called the social compact. I think with an express awareness that the then existing justifications for regulating broadcasting differently uh, would probably have a hard time if they were tested in court. And so this was a sort of a repackaging or a reformulation of these justifications. And he referred to it as either the social compact or uh, and to me, seemingly cyn uh, cynical terms, the quid pro quo, where I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Um, and he basically said that uh, the FCC had been, it had gone too light on broadcasters. If there hadn't been enough license revocations or lack of renewals, 
and that uh, we needed to reinvent the social compact and quantify public interest obligations. Um, he also was a big believer in expressly predicating regulatory approvals, like granting um, uh, mergers and so on, on specific commitments of programming, either in terms of children's programming or in terms of commitments for free time for candidates. And this was one of my favorite statements. Digital broadcasting, he said, represents an opportunity to order up from a wish list of what we think is best for the country. That led a group of us, actually, to put together a book. Uh, uh, Tom Hazlett was uh, one of our contributors to a book we called Rationales and Rationalizations that tried to catalog, uh, catalog the uh, growing numbers of new justifications for regulation and to try and address them. Uh, and fortunately, uh, we never really had to uh, uh, test them in court. The, there were no FCC decisions that were predicated on these new rationales. and then. Uh, uh, at, the, at that point, it still remains sort of an academic debate. But it wasn't just confined to existing media, to broadcasting, or to a certain extent cable. Um, the argument was that the social compact really should extend to all media, or as I said before, reverse engineering convergence. If you had a justification to regulate one medium, the fact that you had some regulatory also allowed the extension of those kinds of obligations to all media, or as Chairman Hunt put it, uh, to broadcast cable, direct broadcast satellite, uh, local multi-point distribution service, wireless cable, and again, it's going to be necessary to quantify those public interest obligations. Now, the interest in doing this hasn't changed. Uh, they simply weren't adopted at the time. Uh, but um, again, I don't mean to pick on Reed Hunt, it's just that he, he's so quotable. Um, he gave a speech at uh, Columbia University about uh, three weeks ago, um, last month, um, uh, talking about his days as chairman of the FCC and, and saying that they had decided at the time to uh, um, sort of say that TV was really, television uh, was, was past, that it was really time to promote the internet as the common medium, and then projected ahead the, broad, the broadband plan hadn't been released yet saying that the broadband plan would uh, represent the end of an area of trying to maintain over-the-air broadcast as the common medium and suggest that this would be, again, an opportunity to uh, have all these great public interest benefits. So uh, the FCC issued on March 16th the national broadband plan that had been uh, required by the American Recovery and uh, Reinvestment Act of 2009 that um, basically touches on all aspects of the emerging medium. Uh, talks about uh, uh, broadband penetration, projects forward to uh, what we need to do to make it available to all Americans, uh, and talks about having a plan for the use of broadband infrastructure and services to advance consumer welfare, civic participation, and a whole laundry list of other public goods. The one that I think is most pertinent to what we're talking about today is the section which is later the three report, it's something like chapter 15, talking about civic engagement, where it, uh, again, notes that there have been criticisms of excessive private sector media industry consolidation, coupled with misdirected um, public sector policies, meaning deregulation, uh, that have inflicted serious harm on traditional news and information media, and that special vigilance must be taken to avoid similar outcomes for new media. And it says that the FCC is going to expeditiously determine what actions are needed to correct these problems. Now, the broadband plan itself does not list what rulemakings it's going to undertake. It instead cross-references other ongoing proceedings that are already have already been launched at the FCC. For example, there was a public notice in January talking about uh, the uh, future of media and uh, the survival of journalism. <coughs> and it talks about what kinds of policies are going to be necessary to revitalize uh, journalism in the digital era. Uh, said that uh, government should avoid hindering innovation and, when appropriate, facilitate a vibrant media, but it should do so in furtherance of the long-standing public interest goals of national policy, including diversity, competition, and localism. And again, the question becomes, what is this going to mean in terms of actual policies that the FCC plans to adopt, and what are the implications, for, at least for our topic today, for uh, analyzing these under the First Amendment? <coughs> 
the future media report lists a number of dockets that it thinks are going to be relevant to its inquiry, and they include some of the more regulatory proposals 